Thank you, folks. Um, absolute pleasure to be here with you. Really looking forward to the discussion and the conversation. Um, great title for us to really get our teeth into. And I'm going to start off and I'm going to talk about Wood Mackenzie's view of the energy transition and how it could potentially pan out. And the key thing that I want to stress here is I'm going to present scenarios to you. Because as you good folks know, there's an awful lot of uncertainty in terms of how this could pan out. So please keep that in mind. And then we'll have a little bit of a discussion what that actually then means for geoscientists. We'll then move on to talk about what skill sets we think we may need in the future. And then lastly, I'd like to finish up with what role can all of us in this room play to help accelerate the energy transition. So this is a simple chart looking out from today out to 2040. And we're looking at carbon emissions and we've essentially got three scenarios. And the top line is the Wood Mackenzie based scenario, which is a rather pessimistic case, which sort of jives with the survey results that Joe shared with us before. So the Wood Mackenzie based scenario is essentially saying the world will not get its act together to address carbon emissions. So you can see them continue to rise and then plateau off about 20, 2030. The second line below that is our carbon constraint scenario, which is much more of an optimistic scenario in terms of what could happen. And then the third is the sense of the IEA sustainable development scenario. And this largely fits with just below the two degree Paris Accord Agreement, okay? So the Wood Mackenzie view is we have an awful lot of work to do collectively to address carbon emissions. Taking those exact same three scenarios and looking at it in terms of the fuel mix, you can see on the left, this is current day, circa 85% of the global fuel mix is coming from oil, gas, coal. And then to the right, you've got our base case, you've got the carbon constraint case, and you've got the IEA sustainable development case. And you can still see that hydrocarbons still make up a large proportion um, our base case, 80%, carbon constraint, 75%, and the IA, even the IA scenario is 60%. And then there's interesting interplays in terms of coal losing out to natural gas because of lower carbon footprint naturally, and then the IA being a big fan of nuclear. Little nuances in there, okay? What I want to do is explore the impact of those three scenarios in terms of us as geoscientists. And this chart is a Wood Mackenzie view of discovered resources and reserves, and then overlaying on that in terms of what yet to find that we need. And that top line essentially marries beautifully with the Wood Mackenzie base case, which again from memory is increasing carbon emissions and then plateauing laterally. And the colors are the light blue are on-stream reserves. The gray is essentially looking at um, underdevelopment reserves. Then you have a little bit of reserves creep, which is the green. Then you have what Wood Mackenzie calls probable development. So these are discovered resources which we think have a natural commercial outcome. And then you have other discoveries which are probably more challenged, maybe more stranded gas, etc. And then you have that little slither in purple, which is yet to find, which is required to make that base case. So in terms of the key question, what does this mean for geoscientists? In this Wood Mackenzie base case, we still need to explore. And we still need development geologists and geophysicists. We still need develop and production geologists and geophysicists. However, if we overlay the Wood Mackenzie carbon constraint view, you can see that we really don't need exploration for what it's traditionally been, which is resource capture. Still need production geoscientists, we still need development geoscientists. If we then overlay the IEA sustainable development scenario, shorthand for the Paris Agreement, you can see we've already got enough discovered resources and reserves that we really don't need to explore. Okay? I stressed right up front that these are scenarios. There's a heck of a lot of uncertainty in terms of how this could work out there's a really broad brush of how this could look. 
My own personal view is I think we'll always still need explorationists, but it's probably going to be much more of a niche activity. And it's not so much going to be focused on material resource capture, which it has traditionally been in the past. It's going to be more niche and it's going to be more involved around portfolio upgrading. Namely, you're confident you can discover resources and reserves that are much more attractive on a resource cost base, on a cycle time, and a carbon footprint than anything that you have in your portfolio today. Key things that we really need to address as society here to avoid that would be Kenzie base case of ever increasing carbon emissions is something we feel very passionate about here with McKenzie is having a realistic carbon price. So this chart is just looking at essentially the EU sort of circa 30% of the market that has a carbon price at the minute. And you can see I've overlaying two carbon prices from the IEA, the Paris Accord Agreement scenario of what you need to realistically address carbon emissions. And you can see it's materially higher than it is today and materially higher in the future. So if we're really serious about addressing carbon emissions, we need to set realistic carbon prices. And there's lots of complications around all of that we'll probably get into in the panel discussion. I stressed right up front that this is very much about scenarios. And personally, I hate scenarios. What I'm far more interested in are what are the key drivers as to where this could go in terms of the energy transition. And in this slide in the top box, I'm looking at policy issues. And the really interesting thing at the minute, particularly in Europe, is that public opinion is way ahead of where the governments and the regulators, right, regulatory bodies are. Will we set a realistic carbon price? Will we have more incentives for EVs, et cetera, et cetera? These are the key things that we need to look at. We also then need to look at things what we, which we term the mat materials transition. This is all around plastics. Up until probably six, 12 months ago, the industry was very much focused on petrochemicals driving future oil demand. With what's happening with plastics at the minute, that's probably uncertain. And then we talked briefly about IEA being very much focused on nuclear being part of the solution to address carbon emissions. That has huge public implications and cost implications. Um, the sandy box to the bottom is looking at technologies. And it's everything from hydrogen, be it um, blue hydrogen, green hydrogen, brown hydrogen, where you're going to source the hydrogen atoms from, the whole way through to carbon capture and sequestration, be it direct from the air, be it related to projects. And candidly, if you're still, even with the IEA scenario, you're going to have 60% of the fuel mix coming from hydrocarbons. We need to figure out something to do with it, how we capture that carbon. And that's something that's really been neglected in the debate. We've seen the drop in renewables in terms of the cost curve. We need to see the same drop in terms of energy storage. And we really need to address EVs and how we encourage EVs. And again, the key uncertainty is the pace of all of that. And then one thing that is often overlooked is energy efficiency. Yes, we have a reasonable handle on that, handle on that in the developed world, or developed world, but not in the developing world. And that could have a huge implication on carbon emissions. So if I was a young geoscientist in the audience, um, what does the future hold? I think those parameters that we've talked about are the key things that I would watch and I would look at and see how they are accelerating. Because that ultimately will dictate how this energy transition works and ultimately that in turn will dictate my role as a geoscientist. Coming on to the new skill sets, the one thing that we do know is geoscientist skill set will be vastly different to those today. Will it be focusing into geothermal? Will it be focused into carbon capture and sequestration? Probably. Will there still be a role in the energy side? Yes, but it may be towards more the production and development side. You're all familiar um, with the demographics, AAPG. These are just AAPG numbers. What I used to always focus on 
was old white folks like me who were going to hang around for the next couple of years to acknowledge transfer over to the young folks coming through. I think in the next five years, we'll have much more of a challenge of getting young, bright graduates into this business. And I think a big, big part of that is what we're talking about today, but also another big part of this is around the mission that we're on here and how we are perceived as an industry. Because rather than being the bad guys, rather than being seen as the laggards, we need to be in the vanguard of accelerating the energy transition. Because that is absolutely critical, not just to the global economy, but also to attracting folks into this business. A couple of things I want to highlight in, in skill sets. Fascinating over the last couple of years in terms of the really big material discoveries. A lot of them been in frontier basins. That's the little star with the F in it along these discoveries. I talked about exploration being much more of a niche kind of a player around material resource capture. If you're confident that you can find low resource cars, material short cycle, low carbon resources, then it does make sense. And recent discoveries would suggest that's more of a frontier setting. And the wonderful thing about frontier geology, I would argue it's much more of an art than a science. Taking a holistic view of what could be Second thing I think that we need to think about is natural gas. One, you can see there's a trend to discover more natural gas than oil, which is obviously a good thing in terms of carbon footprint, but it presents its own challenges to us as geoscientists because there's much more of a commercial overlay as we think about how we make money out of those natural gas discoveries. Um, Sam mentioned was an exploration geologist a long time ago, worked for BG. We used to be able to say by every basin on play, we were looking at what the net back was to Henry Hub. That's the kind of commercial mindset that we all have to have. This is an interesting plot. This is just looking at the history of the oil and gas business by discoveries. And you can see the evolution from onshore to shelf. You can see in the 70s, the opening up of the North Sea, North Slope, Alaska, opening up of deep water and then primarily in the US, North America on conventionals piece. Really interesting debate that we would have had 6, 12, 18, 24 months ago, but where next? What are the next cool, sexy plays that we could look at? I think we have to apply the same criteria we talked about before, material, low resource cost, low carbon footprint, short cycle time. It's not impossible. Look what Exxon have done in Guyana. It fits the criteria perfectly. There are opportunities like that out there. Last thing I want to talk about is the skill sets that we need to complement. We talked about frontier. We talked about commercial mindset. We also have to embrace some of the cool data analytic techniques that are coming to the fore. Primarily statistical techniques that use machine learning, okay? And I'm going to illustrate this very briefly with a case study that we worked on on the back and tight old play in North America. And really the key question we're trying to address here was better forecasting of well productivity. So on the left, you can see a map of the back end. Um, red is good, glacial blue is bad in terms of above average uh, well performance, below average well performance. Circa 8,000 wells, all we've done is plot them on a frequency chart. You can see the mean, 105, and you can see the standard deviation of 55, okay? Of course, we as geologists, when we're trying to predict, the most natural thing we do is we take that map and we start to draw circles. Oh, I can see a trend here. I think it's related to the geology is what's happening here, okay? So what I'm trying to illustrate in the bar chart to the right is how we can improve our forecasting. So the first bar chart is looking at all of those 8,000 wells and the error against the test data, funnily enough, it's the standard deviation, 55,000. If we use the classic standard geological approach of drawing circles around the, the existing well data, we can reduce that down a little bit, 47, 48,000. If we start to look at what really drives well performance and it's essentially completion technology, it's the rock properties and it's the hydrocarbon phase, we start to get a much better forecast and a much more accurate forecast. And essentially that's what those three 
the green, the yellow, and the red are. The green is looking at it from the completion side. The yellow is looking at the geology and, hey, combining the two, look how much of a better forecast we have. These are the kinds of skill sets. It's a very simple example, but these are the kinds of skill sets we as geoscientists have to adapt to complement what we do. Okay, Neil, are you telling me my job as a geoscientist is going to be done away with machine learning and algorithms? Not quite, folks. Just for giggles, the folks that did this analysis for me, I asked them to play around with the data, okay? So the chart to the left and the red is a much better correlation to the test data than the one to the right. But as you folks know, operator IP, month, latitude, longitude has got zip to do with well performance. So the point I'm trying to illustrate here is you still need your subject matter expertise to use these wonderful tools. There will always be a need for a really strong geoscientist employing these tools. It facilitates our role rather than takes over our role. Joe, I'm really pissed that you stole my slide, by the way. Where is Joe? <laughs> um, finishing up on a much more serious note. We in the oil and gas business have done a phenomenal job of driving, literally driving the global economy. <coughs> we have provided relatively cheap, certainly reliable and accessible energy. And that is something that's absolutely fundamental and we should all be immensely proud of. However, over the last decade, it's become apparent that the products that we find and then produce when they're burnt, produce greenhouse gases which cause climate change. So we have to add a fourth thing here in sustainability. But we as an industry need to be in the vanguard of figuring out how to accelerate that energy transition. We're not the bad guys here, folks. We are part of the solution. We're part of organizations that have been around over a century that have been solving big technical engineering challenges. And my goodness, climate change is probably the single biggest technical engineering challenge that we face. And we are ideally equipped to do that. If you look at the basics of our industry, we extract liquids from gas and the stuff that we don't want, we pump back into the ground. That's what we're really good at and that's what's gonna be required to manage carbon emissions in the future. So I ask all of you to be really strong advocates for how this business is part of the solution rather than just being part of the problem. So thank you.